Houston. We dropped out last time right in the middle of, of looking at how we go about perceiving one another. And I kind of left you right in the middle of, of several activities um, that included the following. And that is that we had been looking at perceptions of self, first of all, looking at the impact that names can have on, on what our self view is. Um, we'd looked at the values that may be generated or, or suppressed by particular kinds of names. And we, we concluded on an analysis of self-concept. I want to bear in on that a little bit more and, and refine the definition in a couple of different ways. One of the things that very clearly impacts uh, our view of ourselves is essentially what is generally called self-esteem. And in fact, the, the writer um, Robert Burns has a really apt quote focusing on that in which he writes in a, pair, in a verse, um, Oh, that God the gift would give us to see ourselves as others see us. And if you think about that, it, has, it, has, uh, it registers a kind of a fine point on, on our own views of ourselves uh, in a given situation. But the feedback we get from others is reasonably vital. And so when we define self-esteem, what we're really talking about is um, a concept that can be defined in a couple of different ways. But one of them is essentially <clears throat> excuse me, the personal evaluation that an individual makes of him or herself. And I realized as I was just getting ready to tape that there's actually a redundancy in there. You don't even need the word personal. You could simply call it self-esteem and evaluation that an individual makes of him or herself. That'll be sufficient. Another way to do it puts a slightly different spin on it, but that is to call self-esteem essentially one's sense of one's own worth or capabilities. But uh, as discussed, as we were talking about it in general, low self-esteem may be an indicator of, of psychological disturbance. It's, it's often found in, in people who, have, uh, who are depressed uh, by any other kind of measure. Cooper Smith, um, in an interesting study about a third of a century ago, found that high self-esteem boys had strict but not harsh or cruel parents. Those parents tended to be involved in their boys' lives, which um, confers a sense of competence on the, on the child. And, and once that child's own accomplishments um, are sufficient, they will begin to generate and maintain the child's sense of, of self-esteem, the elevated sense of, of self-esteem. And as a result, um, uh, the child, given his accomplishment, maintains that sense of self-esteem. Low self-esteem boys, on the other hand, tended to have more permissive, um, harsh parents which is a kind of a strange uh, mixture, but they, they're either giving you much more freedom or they're yelling at you a lot. Um, and it may develop in that sense in the youngster a, a sense of helplessness, which, which essentially establishes failure as a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy for that kind of a youngster. Uh, and the result is that the, the child essentially never tries and thus never really develops a sense of self-worth and self-esteem. What we're driving toward here, however, is another concept that I want to talk about, and that is the, the um, ideal self. And so we, we um, look at this kind of a, a concept and, and um, take a few minutes, um, not in lecture, we're not going to take the tape time to do it, but if you're watching this on a, in a media that you can control, put it on pause for a minute and go back into the, the book that accompanies the course, the outline that accompanies the course, and re-rate yourself on the ideal self, the, the right-hand page of the two pages of scales that we've asked you to fill in. And what I'll describe now is the way in which you should score it once you turn the, the, um, the um, screen back on. But take the time to fill out that second set of questions, not as you are, but rather as you'd like to be, the ideal self from, from your own sense of, of development and, and personal worth and so forth. Um, as you may remember, Rogers suggested that, that personal difficulties can occur if the gap between who you are, uh, the self-concept, um, versus who you'd like to be, the ideal self, is too large. But let's calculate this in, in the following direction. If we're trying to get a, a sense of, of our perceptions of self, the first thing you need to do is to reverse on the scale of, of on the sheet of, of scales that I've asked you to do the two pages of ratings. The first thing you want to do uh, is to reverse the, the following scales. And let me show you what's involved there. It's pretty obvious if you read the scales, but in essence what I'm doing is, is uh, suggesting that you organize your data, your ratings, so that the positive end of the scale is to the left end on all of the scales that are involved. Okay, so across the 20 scales, um, they need to, the, the, these 10 need to be reversed. 
um, and I'll show you in a minute what I mean by reversal, but what I'm really arguing is that, that most of us on, on these scales would prefer to maintain the left hand, the right hand end, I mean, rather than weak, we'd rather be strong, we'd rather be optimistic, sociable, excitable, and so forth and so on. One of the ones that might be, I mean, clearly what you need to do is, is to arrange these scales so that it suits your own pattern of, of what is the ideal you. Uh, for instance, on the number eight scale, calm versus excitable, you may be more, more uh, relaxed, more driving toward a calm lifestyle. You may not, not wish to be stirred up about things or, or motivated and so forth and so on. A lot of different ways to define it. But check the, the 20 scales we're going to be working with and make sure that your preferred uh, orientation is on the the left end as as we're uh, as we're scoring it, and then what we're going to do is to is to essentially after reversing each of the designated scales, we're going to score all of the scales as follows. That is taking each of the twenty scales on each sheet. What you're now going to do, and, and you don't have to write the numbers out, but essentially a rating right in the middle would be a four. The further you move toward the the right or left end, the more distant you're, the more the closer you're getting toward the intensity of, of a good or a bad rating, as an example. And so, in essence, what we do is to convert it this way. These are what the ratings are essentially uh, reflecting for you, and that is that that uh, if the check is on on the one or the seven position, you are extremely or rating yourself as extremely, whether it's active, passive, or any of the other categories that we're. Uh, attributes that we're looking at there. Um, it is worth noting that the, the middle position has a little bit of a controversy associated with it, and that is that you can actually check the middle position for either of two reasons. You may view yourself as being just genuinely about halfway between active and passive, or on the other hand, you may view yourself as, as um, equally neither. Uh, you're neither active nor passive. So there, there are a couple different ways in which to interpret that middle rating, but let's set that aside as a measurement issue and not worry about it here, because we're really going after something else. So in any case, you're going to score each of the 20 scales on each of the two sets of ratings that you've now generated, and then do the following. What you're going to do is essentially subtract your self-score, the original as-is rating, from your ideal score. Okay, and so the the um, the net effect there is that that um, what you're going to do is is to essentially end up you're going to measure the discrepancy between your self concept, which is the first rating, and your ideal self, which is the second rating. And as you can see there, the more positive the number, the larger the gap that you have between the two. That is, the the broader the reach between who you perceive yourself to be now as opposed to who you would like to be, um, the ideal self by your version. Um, certain therapists concentrate on the idea that if that gap gets too large, uh, it can potentially lead to personal difficulties in one way or another because the strategy for getting from one to another is a lot harder to, to work out if, if that gap is simply too large. If you're, if you're at one on all the, or at seven on all the scales and one on the ideal scale, uh, uh, that may be a lot harder to, journey than if, if the average rating is a 2.2 on one and 2.1 on the other. That's, that's a pretty easy leap to make in one way or another. So in any case, what all this is driving toward is, is uh, oh, I didn't realize that I'd actually summarized it for you here. Um, but what we're actually looking then at is looking for is the discrepancy measure that we find in, in, the, in comparing the two sets of, of scales. And it's, uh, the semantic differential is a very interesting way to get out the nuances of, of uh, what our life is, is, is of that of which our life is constituted. So in any case, what we're then, what we're moving toward here is essentially a search for identity, um, which I'm going to define essentially as a, um, um, the sense that an individual has of the kind of person that he or she actually is in a, in a given situation. Erickson thinks that the, the search for identity is a major task of adolescence. Okay? It will remain essentially constant as the person moves through different kinds of situations, the self, as, as uh, Erickson is, is defining it. Failure to establish an identity leads to what uh, Erickson calls identity diffusion. Um, and it results in the fact that the individual cannot really enter commitment or close, uh, close relationships uh, for fear of being taken over by that other person. The personality ends up being controlled by somebody else. Um, that all of these occur in adolescence makes uh, sense because of the fact that we're essentially, during adolescence, there are several different objectives or things that are going to happen to us during that period of time. One is the, the uh, achievement of maturity, uh, during which we're essentially reaching um, physical uh, 
um, and sexual maturity. Secondly, we are achieving the ability to think abstractly. We move from concrete toward abstract as our intellectual skills uh, grow during adolescence. And we're essentially reaching a state of emotional and cognitive stability. That's what we move toward. Where uh, you know, a 13-year-old may have this opinion one day and that opinion the next day, a lot of vacillation. We tend to be a lot more stable in our self-assessments by the time we're 18, 19 in, into young adulthood. Um, and then finally, the, the last major thing that's achieved during this period is essentially the removal of constrictions that may inadvertently be imposed by our parents. So you're, you're free of those as, as you move out of the house into your own uh, life space. Mainly achieved when you move out of the house physically and have enough money, <laughs> making enough money to support yourself. That's really when independence is, uh, is established. James Marsha uh, did a really interesting work in, in this area, did, did some very interesting work in this area, and he basically argues that our sense of identity involves, uh, first of all, our ability to integrate both our own and our parents' concerns or expectations. That's, uh, that's one thing that is involved here. Um, secondly, um, we're, we're concerned about the idea of establishing a consistent, ongoing sense of self with a past, a present, and a future. And so the consistency is another thing that we're really building toward is as we work to achieve a, a fully developed sense of self. And then having achieved identity, um, that will influence everything that we do in terms of career, in terms of the values that we ultimately uh, uh, possess and define for ourselves. Um, and, and various beliefs, the behaviors that we exhibit, and so forth. What, what um, Marsha argued was essentially that there are two different factors that really combine to yield four possible statuses for the type of identity that either is or is not achieved as, as we work through uh, the various um, uh, issues that we've been talking about here. One of the factors has to do with the, the whether you're in a crisis situation or not, and he models it in the following way. He talks about achieving identity when you're balancing two different factors, one of which yields a, a reading on, on a crisis, which is either, um, it's, it's essentially defined as an evolving, developing sense of, of self-identity, and commitment, what you decide to commit to. And that he defines essentially as, as um, your personal willingness to, to stick to a selected course of, of action or behavior. Once you analyze the situation and make a decision, this is what I'm going to do, to what extent are you dedicated to that? Will you follow through on it? And he puts all this together in a rather interesting, as I anticipated earlier, four-way model that talks about in a situation where the, where the crisis is present, um, if the commitment is present, what you end up moving into is an achievement of identity. That is, you know who you are, the factors have pulled together, and you are who you've, who you've, uh, you, you can describe to others who you've, who you've actually um, worked to become in that kind of a situation. It's dealt with. During graduate school, um, I entered graduate school as a clinical psychologist, and in, in going through that, I came to realize that I, I really enjoyed experimental research much more than, than uh, clinical type activities helping one another and so forth, um, and especially teaching. So I entered graduate school in a research school um, with an excellent research reputation in the experimental program, hoping to move into clinical. One of those two turned out to be a correct decision. That is, I'd, I'd gone into a school with an experimental basis. Um, and coveted the idea that I was going to, the original strategy in graduate school used to be that you applied to the best experimental program you could get into, hoping then to move over into clinical. Um, and that was my strategy, as was many other people's, but it turned out I liked experimental better than clinical, so I ended up in a good school for that. Um, but the teaching was not a high point in the school that I selected, so in essence, uh, after getting my master's at the initial school, postgraduate, I transferred to the University of Tennessee where teaching was, was uh, significantly valued. Uh, and the, the um, dissertation director that I selected also was built around teaching as, as a major career point. Um, so those kind of, um, the, the achievement of identity can really impact a lot of the different things that you do as, as I've kind of intimated and in working up to, to this point by way of summary statements here. Second thing is that if we look at, at um, 
crises essentially being absent, um, what you've essentially done in, in some cases here in, in failing to achieve identity is that you've, you've created a state that, that uh, Marcia calls identity foreclosure. Uh, you've essentially adopted your parents' ideals or, or you've identified someone else's goals. Um, teenagers are guilty of that sometimes when, when they take on a particular rock star is that they become a, a, a head over heels fan of a particular rock star and they dress in the same way, they affect the same kind of mannerisms, affect the same kind of mannerisms, and so forth. And the net result is that you're really forming an identity by modeling, not by, by actually internalizing the particular values that are involved. And that normally is a stage, not a, an endpoint in, in the process of developing the ideal self. The other kind of situation is where commitment is absent, and in that, that can also cause some, some of different kinds of, of a difficulties, and that is what Marcia calls an identity moratorium, essentially where, where you've, um, the, the teenager with purple hair, pigtails and tattoos is struggling to find themselves, basically. I mean, they make a particular statement in terms of, here's who I am, and you simply have to deal with them with purple hair and, and everything that goes along with it. Um, but usually the result there is eventually a move into identity achievement. Uh, but they may drift, either through inattention or, or inactivity, um, into the state of, of the, the final state, which may also happen, and that is identity diffusion, where the, the net result is simply that, that um, uh, it results from a lack of self-identity in, in this kind of a situation. People in this category differ from those in identity moratorium because these people are not struggling to find themselves. They are simply in a kind of a diffused, inattentive state. So there are a variety of different activities and, and um, results of those activities. Behaviors have consequences, and Marcia does a kind of nice job in, in, that, in those four situations of defining the different types of, of states that you may achieve in working toward identifying who you actually are. So let's move from that into uh, another of the things that, that, that we stumble into sometimes and may commit by way of, of different kinds of errors um, in the issue of trying to perceive not only ourselves but also other people. And in this case, I want to focus more so on, on other people. Um, Magic can be defined essentially as a failure to perceive accurately a physical process that's going on. That is, the magician works essentially on creating illusions. You think one thing is going on and something else magically tends to appear in that, situations, in that situation. One of the problems that we face in, in perceiving ourselves and others um, is the possibility of making various errors of judgment. We don't anticipate correctly what's actually going on in a given situation um, in, in the same way that when we're watching a magician, a musician, a, ma a magician, I knew I'd have trouble with that today, a magician, we do sometimes um, make errors of judgment in trying to describe what's actually going on. One social error is made so consistently among us humans, so, so constantly in perceiving others that it has been called fundamental. And it is in fact in the literature with a lot of literature attached to it called and identified simply as the fundamental attribution error. Um, what determines how you act in a given situation? And when you try to answer that question, there turn out to be two major factors that are contributing here. One is the features of the individual, him or herself, whatever the character is that we have, have developed. It may involve things like our intelligence, uh, our personal skills, uh, there may be particular factors that are, that are um, internal to us. We may be, you know, fundamentally aggressive in, in nature, fundamentally defensive, uh, fundamentally shy. Those are the kind of things that I'm talking about as features of us individually. But on the other hand, there are also some features of, of the environment in which we're operating. Um, that, that may be, we, to which any one of us may be particularly sensitive, the actions of others or inaction. If we're ignored by people, that has an effect on, on each of us individually. And so in that case, those are essentially limits or, or stimuli that are imposed on us by the social or the physical environment in which we find ourselves. So, so the general idea here is that, that um, the factors impacting or setting up the situation where fundamental attribution errors may occur uh, can be either internal and social in, nat in nature generally, or they can be external, uh, part of the environment itself. B.F. Skinner and traditional behavioral behaviors um, would hold the view that the, the external environment is the ultimate determiner of our behavior, period. We're all ultimately driven by that model uh, by the external factors. 
um, surrounding us. Most of us take a more moderate view than that, which was kind of at the extreme on, on one dimension of the polarity that I'm describing here, or the, the two factors. Um, and our explanations of our behavior and others, for that matter, are basically can seem to be both internal or external, depending on whether we see and are observing either our own or someone else's behavior. In that last sentence, I've laid a lot of psychology on you, and that's fundamentally what the funda that's basically what the fundamental attribution error is focusing on. Um, Jones and Nisbet, way back in the early 70s, basically argued that people explain their own behavior in terms of external or environmental uh, causes. That is, I'm acting this way because, and they're identifying some source beyond uh, themselves. But on the other hand, people explain others' behavior in terms of internal attributes of the actor. He's behaving that way because he is, and then they'll list particular characteristics of the individual. And that is the fundamental attribution error. So if we define it, we define it simply as the universal tendency to explain one's own behavior when it has bad consequences, particularly, as a rational response to the situation. And we tend to explain other people's behaviors as originating in their character. That is the fundamental attribution error, OK? But it isn't as simple as that. If the observer is hostile to the acting party, then good results are credited to blind luck. On the other hand, if bad results uh, occur, they're credited to character flaws in the same individual. That is the fundamental, attribu uh, fundamental attribution error. We file that under uh, a phrase that I'm sure you've heard before, damned if you do, damned if you don't. We can nail you either way with the fundamental attribution error. Um, People's occasional reaction to someone being raped is, is, um, is, is interesting. Um, one, one reaction that you'll hear among, among other people observing or, or learning of the event is essentially, nice girls don't do that. You'd never get into that kind of a situation to begin with. She asked for it. She shouldn't have dressed that way. She shouldn't have been there, etc., etc. All of those are, are blaming the, the, the individual, the character of the, of the individual. The result is that society's attention has shifted away um, from actions to, to correct the situation that created the problem to begin with. Um, do you know people who don't communicate with other members of their family? That's one way in which that distancing may be established. Often the problem was caused by a, a misattribution of causes to some kind of earlier behavior in a given situation. But there are some other errors built around that central concept of the fundamental attribution error that can also impact uh, our judgments and, and the, the accuracy or inaccuracy of what we do. And in fact, one of them is blunt enough that we're going to describe it simply among the other errors. The first one we'll look at is essentially an accuracy error. Um, experience teaches us a lot, but not always the right thing. Um, the good guys, for instance, do not always wear white hats. People grow up sometimes in, in psychologically abusive homes in which they are repeatedly told that they're stupid, they're tall or they're short, they're ugly or they're fat, you name it. Um, but that's an accuracy error of, of perception of, of the individual in that situation, and it does have consequences for the individual. Another example of, of a kind of a variation, a nuance on an accuracy error is things like stereotypes. Stereotypes in and of themselves are not particularly healthy, um, but we all use them because they provide an initial basis on which to react to people, and they remain stereotypes until and unless we back away from them when you're faced with an individual. That is, a stereotype is a description of a general group of people, whether we're talking about the Irish or, you know, you name it. Uh, the, the, a typical Irish perception or perception of an Irishman is, is a stereotype. And that's okay to give you a basis on which to interact with that individual initially, but you obviously are still operating as, with a stereotype if you simply assume as a fact the stereotype is correct and then only interact with the person that way. Stereotypes are okay as long as they're adjusted in the face of, of evidence when, you're st when you start interacting with somebody. Um, a third kind of error that we may have, in addition to the two I've already talked about, accuracy and, and stereotypes, involves what is called an actor-observer effect. Um, when observing others doing things we do not like, we see them as willful acts on the part of those other people. Under similar circumstances, when observing our own behavior, 
we see ourselves as a victim of circumstance. It's another variation of the fundamental attribution error there. Teenagers arguing with parents, okay? Parents see them as stubborn, impetuous, too independent. Teens view parents as bossy and controlling. Teens are responding to social pressure and hormones, okay? Parents are responding to fears of the consequences of their children's behavior, okay? Each is making a situational attribution for their own behavior. I'm acting this way because, and they're naming elements of the other party in that situation. That's, that's an actor-observer bias in, um, in, in the form of, of the fundamental attribution error. There's another kind of error that we can also make, or that we do commit, and that is what's called a relativity error. Um, what each of us tends to have for behaviors that we engage in is what's called a reference group. And that is essentially a social group providing an individual standards for modeling that person's own behavior. Okay? Uh, a person may or may not belong to a selected reference group, um, may choose to or may choose not to. Uh, but we often use it as a basis for comparing uh, our own or someone else's behavior in terms of what is the reference group that they're trying to model in that situation. Uh, the problem you have is, is the following, and that is that the, the indirect impact of the reference group can be illustrated by the, the science fair that I just recently served as a judge for here in, in Houston. And that is that if you win a science fair project in, in Podunkville at Midwest State or something, and I don't mean to name a particular school here, your project will probably not compete as well uh, against the winner of the Houston-based International Science and Engineering Fair, if only because the Houston winners um, have competed against somewhere between 11 and 1,200 other competitors. It's not that many in a given area. But you have a tough series of competitions to get through to get through the Houston Fair. And because of the, the reference group, that is the, the other competitors in, in HISD uh, and surrounding districts, that's a tough market to bring a, a new idea research-wise in and have the judges interact with you and decide, yeah, that's the best in this group. Uh, the competition is simply strong here. And so the references is, is, uh, are different in the two situations. From a much smaller town, somewhere out in the middle of West Texas, it is simply that there is not as much competition there. And given the smaller number of people, they're not as likely to be, you know, in a normal distribution of ideas, they're not as likely to be ideas that are, that are competitive at the, at the high ability end of the, of the scale. But that's a reference group problem in that situation. It doesn't have to do with the absolute ability of either of the people that's involved in that kind of a, a comparison. We've got some other things that, that are involved, one of which is a, a self-serving bias. We will attribute our successes to our own hard work and skill, but we attribute our failures to circumstances. Just plain bad luck, okay? Depressed people are more likely to attribute their features to, to internal factors than our non-depressed people. So there are, there are a whole bunch of things that are interacting here, but our degree of, of depression or lack thereof excuse me, is one of the things that, that uh, impacts our, our ability to analyze or, or the, the basis on which we analyze our successes and, and failures. Um, flirting, for instance, um, is, is a self-serving bias of classic proportions. Men are much more likely to interpret a woman's friendliness as sexual in terms of the flirting that goes on. It's, it's just in the nature of men themselves that, that um, the, the casual interactions that women have with one another are not meant to be sexual at all, but the same level of casual interaction between man and woman puts the man uh, into a sexual mode of thinking at a much earlier level. Um, and that's a, that's a self-serving bias on the part of, of males in that kind of an interaction. There are some other errors we can talk about, one of which is an error of expectancy. And that is you see what you expect to see. This is one of my favorite studies in all of the literature of psychology. What they did in this study was to introduce a lecturer in, in a classroom. Okay, the, the instructor came into the classroom with, with a colleague uh, dressed in, in a particular way, and the lecturer was introduced with the standard set of information about where he was educated and what he would be talking about and so forth. But what was included, the last statement of the introduction said, um, people who know him consider him to be a rather uh, sorry, a very warm person, industrious, critical, practical, determined. And then the, inter the introducer simply turned to the colleague who started talking. On the other side, in the other case, same person dressed in the same way, brought into a, a comparable class, was introduced by their instructor with the same general introduction about facts and one difference in the concluding sentence. And that is that the last sentence in the second situation was, 
People who know him consider him to be a rather cold person, industrious, critical, practical, determined. And if you listen to those two descriptions, there's only one difference. And that is, in one case, the person is described as a very warm person. And what, what increases the power of this, well, let me give you the results, and then I'll come back and explain why it happened. And that is that after lecturing twice as, for 20 minutes, twice as, almost twice as many students interacted with the person who'd been in the, introduced as a very warm person than among the students listening to the instructors in, in the place where he had been introduced as a very cold person. Just that one word made a difference. And that is the entire introduction was the same with one exception, and that was the first of the last five words was he was considered to be, a, people who know him considered to be a, quotes, very warm person. The other four words by, by design were essentially neutral. That is on a, on a warm, cold, or a good, bad scale, words like industrious, critical, practical, and determined are right at the middle of the scale. They're neither good nor bad. They're neither, they're neither warm nor cold. They're just very neutral words. And the effect of that one introductory phrase, very warm or rather cold, was enough to sway people's interpretation of those words that were right in the middle in one direction or the other. So what they actually ended up hearing in their own mind was essentially the same word five times over. So if they were introduced as a very warm person, then industrial becomes dedicated, hardworking, and so forth. Critical becomes, uh, you know, observant and, and a sharp observer. Um, practical becomes hands-on orientation toward whatever you're doing. Um, and, and well, you can, you can translate each of the words. Determined, again, has a very positive effect in this kind of a, uh, a situation. And so the net effect is that, that that one neutral, that one positive or negative word swayed the, the net effect of, of all five of the other, um, all four of the other, other words in that situation. What's created there is an error of expectancy. And finally then, um, we also have what is called an illusory correlational error, which is another one that we may make. Um, I failed years ago professionally. I failed to reimburse a participant in a in a workshop for, for some expenses that, that were to have been paid for by the workshop funds. And once the error was pointed out, I initiated the paperwork the very day to make sure that the man got paid. Uh, it didn't happen fast enough, so what he ended up doing was calling the president's office at the University of Houston here. Um, they called the vice president, the vice president called the dean, the dean called the department administrator, and the department administrator called me. What's the problem? Well, the net effect was that, that once he'd been paid, I wrote him a letter um, with a list of the hierarchy above me with the suggestion that uh, the next time he had a problem, if he ever did, and it was certainly my intent not to create problems for him, that my departmental administrator was the most obvious person to, to contact because uh, she was uh, responsible for the bills. That would be the best person to contact if such a problem ever develops. And his response was just classic. Uh, it was simply, I always go to the top. And given that the, the uh, university's check arrived the day after my call, I see no reason to change. Which of course um, is related to an, an error, a processing error. Uh, the fact that what he's operating on there is an illusory correlation because in fact he never saw it but I could have documented the fact that the paperwork to get him paid had cleared my desk over a month prior to the letter that I eventually sent him and the idea that, that the check arrived uh, the day after he would called the president was totally unimpacted by the fact that, that he'd contacted the president of the university. It was simply the work was being done as it was, should have been done earlier. But the, the idea that the check arrived the day before, the day after he'd called the president was just an illustrious correlation. Um, in, in finishing this out, my, one of my favorite examples, uh, this seems to be a collection of favorite examples right here. Um, the other example of an illustrious correlation and what it can make you worry about in a given situation um, you, is, is built around the following. You may remember that a number of years ago, um, Boston, uh, well, in fact, the whole East Coast experienced a major power failure. It, it was quite impressive the day it happened. I think if I remember, it started out in a county in, in New York somewhere, but the, the sudden loss of power 
um, being drawn from one unit had a cascading effect because of the way the, the entire area is electrically interconnected. And so the loss of one area caused another to shut down and the net effect was essentially everything from north of Boston all the way down to, to about the Baltimore area was in the dark uh, over the course of, of several hours. And, and one of the stories that came out of that that I've always enjoyed was that a, a youngster was walking home at dusk uh, after after a ball game, after practicing a ball game, a little league game in in uh, Boston area, and he was as most kids are when they're walking home with a baseball bat. He was swinging it. He was just practicing his swing as he walked along, and he you know he'd kind of you know hold it up and take a whack at anything that got in the way. And what happened was that that just as and he was on a, a bunker hill looking out over over Boston as he was swinging at various things. And just as he took a swing at a light pole which he connected with, the lights in Boston went out. So this kid saw the fact that he took a swing at a light pole and all the lights that he could see went out. Uh, and the result was that he ran home terrified. But the essential result there was that was the end result of, a, of simply an illustrious correlation. The fact that he hit the pole was, was just ancillary to the fact that the lights went out in Boston at that particular time. So let's move from that into the next area that we want to look at and that has to do with uh, communication. Um, I, what I wanted to do at this point was to review a couple of different deadlines with you. Uh, not that there is one immediately due, but just to remind you that in the progress of the course, the, the um, final project is normally due somewhere around um, a couple of lectures before the end. And we're now about uh, five or six lectures. This is number 20 out of 26. And the deadline usually falls, and that may change from semester to semester, but it normally falls somewhere around lecture 24. So I just want to sensitize you to the fact that there is an approach deadline regarding your portion, the independent project portion of the, of the course itself. Uh, it will be due here uh, shortly. And the other thing has to do with the fact that what I would like to do in the last lecture is take about 20 or 30 minutes during the course of that last lecture to interview several of you regarding the project that you're actually doing or finishing, I hope, right now. Um, and it would be helpful for me when you submit that project if you would include either within the project or somewhere subtly on the back of the project your phone number and your email address and it'll depend on how much time I have as to which device I'll be using to try and reach you but if you would include when you submit the project include with it the phone number at which you're most easily reached say late afternoon, early evening hours, it would be very helpful because I'd like to try and get uh, perhaps a half a dozen of you in here to describe for, for fellow students what you actually did in your project because I, I will trust the fact, given past experience, that we'll get some really creative examples of, of different kinds of projects that, can, that have been done. And I'd like to recognize those and share them with, with um, other people, not just viewers this semester, students this semester, but people who may view the material at some time later in the semester. So if you would, just include some way in which I can reach you as part of the um, project itself. And it has the extra benefit that if there's any problem, and there very seldom is, but if there's a problem, it makes it easier to get in touch with you to discuss how to resolve any particular problem you may have had. So. Enough said. Just include some way that we can reach you easily uh, with your report. Probably a telephone is, is preferable. Now, let's look at things that we use for communication, and that's pretty easy. We use words. They're really a key to communication. Um, but they turn out to be very tricky things, and I can give you several examples of what I'm talking about here. For instance, um, Yosemite National Park um, announced uh, that a bear named Sugar Plum was going to be shot on sight. Okay, and the net result was that there were howls of protests nationally of, about why Sugar Plum was being uh, shot. Uh, and in essence, the, the, what was lost on, in public appreciation of what was going on was the fact that Sugar Plum uh, had grown into one very dangerous bear. I mean, he was a real public nuisance, in the, a menace in the, in the park. It was the kind of bear that would uh, invade campgrounds at night and raise all sorts of chaos. He would attack visitors along the, the state highway and, or, you know, the, the park roads and so forth. And the net result was that, that the effect of the, the howling was it kind of missed the point, and that was that in fact he was simply a dangerous bear. One of the net results of feeding the animals in a national park. They really discourage you from doing it. And sugar plum was the reason for it. One of the effects of, of that howling, uh, well, it had two effects. One was that the, the bear was saved, but it was moved to the very most remote area of the park. It, it was carried as far away from public roads and campgrounds as possible. 
Um, and the other thing was that from that point onward, they never again called bears by cute names like Sugar Plum, because you don't want to be known as the man who struck down, who killed Sugar Plum. So what they did from that point onward was simply number the bears. So bear number 26, bear number 28, bear number three, whatever, uh, is the way in which they were identified uh, afterwards. The power of word Sugar Plum is just not something we want to kill. Um, Ken Lay. When he originally developed uh, Enron as, a, as an oil company and ultimately financial fiasco, uh, investment fiasco, actually was entertaining a very different name at the beginning of it when he was you know, pulling together the resources to create Enron. One of the words that he considered in naming the company was Enteron, E-N-T-E-R-O-N, -E which is okay until it was pointed out to him. The fact that in Spanish, that word is very similar to the word that is normally used to identify the alimentary canal. The, the, um, the digestive processing system of people. Um, and at one end, that's okay, but at the other end, that's not particularly something you want to have associated with a particular company. That was a wording problem. Uh, when GM first introduced its car called the Nova, um, when it introduced it in South America, then and only then did, did, did it, well, at that point, sales bombed. And they discovered with research why it happened, and that was that in Spanish, uh, Nova means it doesn't go probably not something you want to have attached to your, your car as, as, a, uh, as a name. And if you think about car names, if you think about them as a, kind of as a class, we have names like Mustang and Roadmaster and Escort, but we don't have the Weasel, the Roadkill, or my favorite, the Limp Lettuce, all of which would be potential names. It's just they're not used to name things like cars. Um, we now call it the Department of Defense here in, in the US. But you know what its former name was? It was called simply the War Department, which is functionally what it's, what it's about. Um, but that presents the US as a much more aggressive nation than we really wanted to be known as ar around the world, hence the name was changed. Somehow the old name just applies aggressiveness, and that wasn't really quite what we were after. Um, we once used to, another way in which language has changed is, is the fact that we used to use the words imbecile, moron, and idiot to identify those with progressively more severe forms of, of intellectual deficits. We now refer to them simply as moderately, severely, or profoundly mentally retarded. Again, because of the negative affect that was picked up by imbecile, moron, and idiot. Uh, the words themselves came to have more negative affect than really was intended as, as simply a mental health uh, or intellectual uh, identifier. Things change all around us all the time. Um, secretaries are now called office assistants. Garbage collector, now called a sanitary en or sanitation engineer. A bombing raid is defined instead as a protective reaction. Deaths are called casualties. And my favorite, a first class piece of dead cow bone is referred to as prime rib. So all of those are examples of, of the ways in which we use words for, for various kinds of effects and the effects that words can have on us. Um, they are important in communication. They're really key, the key element on which communication is, is based. The main difference, if there is one, between other animals and we humans is our language, the ability to communicate that it fosters among humans in the given uh, in the given situation here. Uh, our vocabulary grows to about 50,000 words. Your vocabulary is a, in, when you entered college was guesstimated to be around 50,000 words. And during college, that vocabulary will roughly double one more time. That's the last major increase in your vocabulary that will occur unless you start doing Reader's Digest puzzles and, and um, crossword puzzles in the Sunday newspaper. That will also foster vocabulary. But in general, our vocabulary stabilizes after the last doubling at around 100,000. And many of that last doubling uh, involve technical specialty words um, in jargon in, in the particular discipline that you're educated in, given whatever your major is um, in college. Um, and our education is basically built around com increasing the complexity of ideas that, that we can generate and hold and communicate about using the vocabulary that we develop. Uh, so the, the words are, are integral to the, the improvement in educational skills that we achieve as we go through college. There are various kinds of, of um, problems that can occur with, with word meanings. Okay? They're important in communication, but they also have some, some uh, problems that can crop up in, in various kinds of ways. For instance, um, uh, 
how would you, I'm not sure whether I'm ready for this example yet. Give me a second here to catch up with where I am in my names. Oh yes, here we are. Okay. How would you punctuate these, um, that's not what I was looking for. Hang on a second, let me look around here. Um, let me back up one second and see what we have. It's just there. Okay, so this is one way in which these six words can be utilized. Woman without her man is nothing. And that clearly, I mean, that's, that's essentially, um, I'll get back to that. I knew there was another example here. Pardon my, my misarray of, of presentation. I'll get back to that one in a minute. This is the one I want to challenge you with first. How would you punctuate these six words? I don't want to say them because even in enunciating them, I imply a certain ordering. But if you look at those six words, what kind of pronunciation would you be campaigning to attach to them? And there does turn out to be a very simple way to punctuate them. But what it requires is that in one case, what you have to do is convert a noun into a verb a word that's normally used as a noun, and you have to convert a word that's normally used as a verb into a into a, um, into a, you have to convert a noun into a verb and a verb into a noun. And when you do that, what you can then do is to punctuate it this way. Time flies, they go too fast. And in essence, to, to catch the pun in that, you have to alter the way in which you use both the word time and the word flies. But it does provide those six words, which don't necessarily look like they're, they're kind of implied they might be related, but, but it doesn't look like they're directly related to each other until you punctuate it correctly. Um, and then the point is that, that words can have many different meanings, and, and therein lies some of our difficulties in, in communicating with each other. Consider the, the word line, which is a fairly simple word. But if you think about the incredible number of ways in which you can use that, just consider the following array of sentences. One is, uh, form a line down the hallway. Plug the electric line in there. She's presenting the party line. Recite the final line of the poem. Drop me a line when you get there. Prince Charles is the next king in the Windsor line. My parents lived on the, at the end, lived on the red line outside Washington. What kind of a line are you handing me? What's your line? Have you seen iron filings reveal magnetic force lines? We had to throw her a line. That sports car has really clean lines. The store carries the full line. He nailed a line drive. He continued to line the casket with flowers. She wanted to line her skirt with silk. Use the ruler to draw a straight line. Put it on the line. We're going to proceed with the fundraising in line with your report. The president will campaign to line up the votes he needs. In essence, what is being suggested there, the word line is, is rather relatively unique in, in English because it has over 50 distinct definitions that can be associated with it, and the key to it is essentially the context within which the word appears. Because I've just given you, uh, I don't know, there may be 25 or 30, I didn't count them, but there are a bunch of different uses of the word line. And you could attach very different meanings to the word line in each of those cases. In some cases, it was a vacuous comment. In other cases, it was talking about stylistic considerations and so forth. The context is really important. So the other words um, appearing with a word will oftentimes help you define the, the meaning of the particular word that's involved. Um, Context is what removes ambiguity from a statement like, the police must stop drinking after midnight. You have to think about that a minute to understand what's actually being said. The police, a task of the police is to stop people from drinking after midnight. But if you read it the wrong way or interpret it in another way, it might simply be that the police have a drinking problem themselves. They are frying chickens. That one's hard to intone without implying a particular um, message, but in one case frying is an adjective, in the other case it's a verb, depending on which meaning you want to use there. And my favorite is visiting relatives can be dangerous. That's an example of where the context doesn't quite clarify what's really meant in a given situation. Give you another example of, of a problem that we have with words, and that is words with fuzzy borders. Those are another factor that, that, we, um, that we often have difficulty with. For instance, consider what is a dog? What do you mean by a dog when you use that word? How do we define it? Well, think about it as, as an exclusion process. They have to have four legs? Well, yes, that's true, but what about a wolf? How do you distinguish a dog from a wolf? They both have four legs. 
Well, but a dog has a tail. Well, how about a boxer? Doesn't have a tail, still a dog. Yeah, but dogs have to have fur. Well, what about a Mexican hairless? So, you know, for almost every attribute you label, I can come up with a, a counterexample that fits within the class but has that particular exception to its particular attributes. And so essentially what we do is, is to abstract for, for, um, for meaning. Um, a given flower is a rose, and what's needed to make it a rose is things like um, its smell, its shape, its form, the color that is associated with it. But rose becomes essentially an abstraction. It's, it's kind of what's illustrated by, meant by, the word rose itself. Um, it can be broadened further to become a flower, a representative of flowerness. It can be broadened even further to become a plant. And it can be broadened yet again to become a living organism. So that in general, what happens is the communication becomes more difficult for us uh, as the words that we refer to become more and more abstract. In their, in their reference, what they're, what they're referring to. That's the primary reason why countries have such difficulty negotiating peace treaties or treaties on anything, land use, you name it. Because when you really get down to the nitty gritty of exactly what do we mean by using this word in this context and so forth, that's what causes the problems. That's, that's where the difficulties end up uh, being created in this situation. Meanings, in fact, can also be changed not only by context, but by sound. Um, Noam Chomsky writes about, uh, we've talked about this once before, but surface structure, which is essentially identifying the, the, the speech that I'm using right now is, is a manifest example of, of surface structure. I've ended up doing some processing to determine what I want to offer to you, and then it comes out and it's offered in the form of speech. But speech is ultimately being used to relay a thought process in me to one in you to generate one in you. Writing is the same example. It's, it's another example of surface, con uh, surface structure. Um, and it's based, according to Chomsky, on deep structure, which is kind of the, the internal parallel to the language that we're using when, when we actually communicate with each other. Um, communication occurs when the speaker's deep structure is understood by the listener. So in fact, if, if I make a statement at any time during the lecture and you simply don't understand it, the difficulty is that I didn't provide enough clues in the, in the, the surface structure that I was offering to you to, to put, a, put a fence around what I was particularly trying to, to say to you. I, I didn't describe it accurately enough in that situation. Puns exist as humor. Because what happens is that the, the, um, the change in meaning that occurs when, when the, the listener suddenly must shift his or her deep structure. It's that jarring shift that occurs, the, 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 that creates the humor in that situation. Um, I told a joke uh, a week or so ago that was not particularly well received, so I have another one to offer to recover my reputation a little bit here. Uh, and it turns on the meaning of a word. Um, it deals with a, a neighbor, um, of mine who, who tends to go out uh, track every morning, just, just runs a couple of miles around the neighborhood. Um, and the, the morning he was out running around, one of the mornings I'm talking about here a couple of weeks ago, Friday a couple of weeks ago, um, as he was running along with his track shorts and, and t-shirt, you know, carrying as little as possible with him because it was really the body that he was trying to build up. Um, as he was running along, he discovered a, a tennis ball in the, you know, as he was running past a, a tennis, the, you know, the school fields next to the tennis court, right out in the gutter there was a brand new fancy green fuzzy um, tennis ball. And apparently somebody had hit it on the court and, and just, you know, in looking for it, had not found it because it had rolled, you know, 50 feet past the courts out into the gutter and that was where it had ended up. So as he was running along, um, it very obviously stood out to him, so he picked it up and, and was running along. Um, with very proud of the fact that he found himself a new tennis ball for, for the other sport that he enjoyed. Uh, but as he ran, he realized that it was really disbalancing him because, you know, they, uh, I don't run, so I don't know, but I'm assuming that there's some balance implied in, in moving of the arms in a very set pattern. And, and it, what he got annoyed with was the fact that it, now all of a sudden he was walking along having to carry this tennis ball. It was disturbing him to, you know, have the, the one um, object in his hand, and he got, he got worried about that. Um, and his solution was, you know, he thought about, well, gee, I've got pockets. What else can I do with this? If I put it down, somebody else is going to pick it up. Um, so what he did finally, after, after thinking about it, was he just pulled his shorts out, threw the ball in, closed his shorts up, and ran on. And a couple of minutes later, one of the uh, women from another house in the neighborhood came out and started running along with him um, and was just going along quietly, padding along right beside him. 
and and uh, she noticed the the um, the swelling in his pants. I don't know any other way to say it. Um, and and she ran along, uh, and the the longer she ran, the more curious she got about it. And she finally turned to him, and and said, uh, you know, uh, uh, Josh, what is there a problem here? Do we have something we need to talk about? And he he. Um, Kind of got a puzzled look on his face, and and she said, "The swelling in his hand, in in your pants," um, and he said, "Oh, it's a tennis ball." And she looked right back at him and said, "Oh boy, I'll bet that hurts. I had a tennis elbow just last week." Think about it a minute. So, sounds, puns are based essentially on on uh, changes in word meaning. Um, but they, as I said, they can also be changed by, by sounds. Um, and in fact, in many cases, it's the same word, identical sound, uh, yielding different meanings. A, a number of different examples I could cite, write, W-R-I-T-E versus R-I-G-H-T, uh, is one uh, difference in word. High as in high versus somebody who is high versus low. Uh, son, S-U-N versus child, S-O-N. A lot of different examples. Um, and now we get to the example that I meant to give you earlier, and that is that if you take these six words, sound is basically what lends meaning to this. Um, I kind of cued it uh, by this slide that wasn't where it was supposed to be earlier. But in essence, one of the ways to, to organize this is to stress it in the following way, in which you say essentially, woman without her man is nothing, okay? And some people in the room will hiss and boo and say, well, that clearly isn't correct. Um, but then on the, well, I missed the other example. I, well, this thing is really screwed up this morning. Apologies for that. So in any case, um, the other example of that is woman, period. Without her, man is nothing. So in, in the, it's the same six words, but by the changing the, the intonation, you get a 180 degree turn in what's actually implied in those two uh, situations. And it's sound that basically does that for us in, in this particular um, uh, example that I'm proposing here. So, in essence then, what we're moving into is, is uh, semantics, which is uh, essentially the meaning of words. Um, and there are a couple of different examples. I'm now showing things that I didn't expect to show up until later. We seem to have had a screw up in our, our uh, um, been, well, let's just wait ahead here and see what we find. The next thing I wanted to talk about was essentially um, the meaning of words uh, in terms of semantics. Um, and in this case, you, you ask um, a mechanic, for instance, asks his or her customer to get in the car that he's been working on, she's been working on, uh, with the engine running um, at idle, and asking her to step on the gas pedal a little bit to increase the, the speed of the engine. And later on, uh, the mechanic says, hold it down. And the result is the woman steps harder on the gas. And the, the, uh, the mechanic, of course, erupts, no, hold it down. And meaning in that case, what he meant was to hold the idle speed down, not the accelerator. And in that case, the, the, um, the meaning of the words is, is critically different in terms of the effect that is ultimately uh, uh, achieved in that, in that particular situation. Um, the, um, the, uh, there's the other one. I knew it was there. We'll eventually get this all straightened out. That would be the other intonation that could be done. Woman, period, without her, comma, man, it's nothing. Same six words, but the intonation order, uh, the, the sequencing order, makes a big difference in, in the perceived meaning in that situation. Sorry, I'm kind of jumping back and forth here. A couple of sides just got out of, out of order. Now we're back on where we're supposed to be here. Semantics then um, essentially has to do with, I've got a couple of other examples I want to, to uh, give you for that. Uh, sentences, in some cases, given the semantics, can be self-contradictory. So you end up hearing a, a statement like, uh, my sister is an only child. Well, that's just not cognitively possible because uh, sister implies a brother, another relative, um, and that, that means that the parents involved have more than one child. Um, another example is an open secret. If it's open, it can't be a secret. By its very definition, the two words are simply opposed to each other. Uh, another one is um, um, essentially, let me see what else I wanted to talk about here. Well, those are, are both accepted meanings. The, the idea that, that an open secret is simply a secret that no longer is. It's, it's now, um, the, the information has been revealed. But there's another format that such uh, word conundrums or problems can, can take. And that is what's called an oxymoron, where you've got two terms that basically don't mix with each other. Um, 
self, they're, they're essentially self-contradictory figures of speech. And I can give you a number of different examples, and you can probably think of more. But uh, one is what's called an athletic scholarship. Okay, It's awarded on athletic, not academic abilities, and yet it's formed as, as a scholarship, which is fundamentally based on, on scholarness. Thunderous silence. Have you ever heard that phrase? That's essentially a, a, a silence that is particularly quiet in, in an auditorium or something. You make a statement, and the net result is thunderous silence. It's not just quiet with fidgeting. It's simply quiet in that situation. Military intelligence, that's a political uh, conundrum for, for some people. Plastic glasses, you'll see those advertised in stores. Go get a plastic glass. Well, which is it, plastic or glass? You're with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're in a party situation, you finally generate a reason to get out of it, and one turns to the other and says, at last we're alone together. Well, which are you? Are you alone or are you together? Um, hot dog. I mean, if you really think about the meaning of a hot dog, it's not dogness, and typically it's no longer hot when you, when you eat it. Guest host. That one is particularly rich in misinformation, if you think about it. When, when uh, Jay Leno has a substitute or David Letterman has a substitute, he or she is referred to as a guest host. Well, which are they? Are they a guest or are they a host? And that's the, the uh, conundrums that are built out of uh, oxymorons, as, as they're known, word combinations of mixed meaning. And if we get to then the, the, the basics of communication, uh, there are a couple of different elements that we can talk about. Um, Martin Buber has really an exquisite quote that's, that's probably a third of a century old by now. But he says, and I'm quoting here directly, on the far side of the subjective, on this side of the objective, on the narrow ridge where I and thou meet, there is the realm of between. And that realm, that gap of between, is bridged by communication. I find that a kind of a nice, really challenging quote. Foss and Hake, uh, Don Foss now is on our faculty. He was at UT Austin at the time this book was written with Don Hakes, um, with Hakes. Um, in 1978, he, he starts the book, they start the book with a marvelous quote on the psychology of language with a quote that says, language is surely the most important tool of communication that we have at our disposal. They point out that we communicate in many different ways. A look can kill, as one example. A tone can indicate that a speaker means the opposite of what he or she is saying. The difference there is between thanks as opposed to thanks. I don't mean to imply the, the nonverbal look of scowling and so forth, but, but even the, the tone itself conveys the, the very distinct different meaning in, in the word thanks there. A touch sometimes says more than a book can, those authors suggest. Um, two people will sometimes speak to each other quite differently when they are alone than when a third person, third party, is, is present. All of those are examples of, of uh, essentially uh, language. They, they were talking about language, but in reality what they were really writing about was the primary thing um, that is enabled by language, and that is communication. Uh, that's what the, the key difference is in, in those examples that they gave uh, as the basis for the wonderful achievements uh, about which they were writing in that, in that situation. So though we're talking of language, um, in reality, as I said, they were dealing with this intense word called communication. So let's go ahead and define that, what we mean by it. One of the, one of the ways in which that can be communicated is simply the transmission of language, uh, sorry, of energy from one place to another. That's one technical definition of, of uh, communication. A second one has to do with, with defining it as, as an exchange of messages by spoken or written and or nonverbal means. That, that the nonverbal feature is, for instance, the, the scowl that I had when I was saying to, to you, mimicking thanks. That's a different than the smile you're likely to see on somebody who's saying thanks. Um, and the third way in which we can define it is simply uh, uh, the discriminatory response of an organism to a stimulus. That goes all the way back to S.S. S. Stevens, and I want to pick a bone about that one. I don't happen to like that definition. I'll show you why in a minute. I'm going to argue that essentially communication is essentially a social affair. You have to have a giver and you have to have a receiver. 
We humans have developed many varied systems of communication that will facilitate our social life and, and uh, make it possible, essentially. Um, where animals have little social life um, in packs, they have a social life, I should say, in packs um, to hunt or make war. Humans, on the other hand, exist socially in a way largely unknown to animals. So you and I get together in groups for various social situations way beyond hunting or, or uh, mutual defense. Um, and language is basically the primary system of, of, that we utilize for, for communication. But uh, it's not like the signs of animals. We can do far more than call our young with, with, um, with language. Um, suggest matings and, and war cries of, or warning cries of, of danger. We can utter almost any thought with language. We share with animals a number of instinctive responses that I've been talking about, cries of pain, cries of alarm. Those are built in, those are instinctive. But we can smile, we can groan, we can shiver or blush or yawn or frown. All of those are, are outward communications that, that tell somebody who's watching us something different about our current state in a given situation. Mother hen can collect her, her chicks by simply clucking. Um, and it's an innate releaser for the, for, the, for the chicks to rush back to mom. Um, but it's about the only thing she can achieve by that clucking. She can't talk about, look at the gorgeous uh, whatever, grain that I found or, or what have you. The, there's no linguistic phrase for that. There's no cluck that involves rich grain or anything like that. Um, Colin Cherry, um, about half a century ago, had a really nice quote to say that, that <laughs> summarizing what I've been talking about, human language is vastly more than a complicated clucking system. There's a lot more that we accomplish with our language than simply gathering the young to enjoy a, a new meal or something like that. Um, it, it essentially allows communication, essentially allows our worldwide social life to exist as it does. It fosters organization. Um, from the, from the villages of the past, we've grown to see economic systems that bind us worldwide. I mean, they're, they're worldwide structures that, that hold us together now, nowadays based on communication. The language is fundamental to that. Um, as we get into the study of, of communication, what I want to do is qualify my use of some of the terms that we've already shared. Um, words are not linked one-on-one -on -one in, in specific meanings, okay? So we're, we're, um, what I'm saying is, is not that we put the words, you know, like a train together. Um, they're not linked one-on-one -on -one with specific meanings such that we translate sounds, then syntax, and finally semantics. All of those fold into the meaning that we're actually relaying to, to uh, one another in a sentence that we generate. Um, words do not carry all the meaning. Their context, the order in which they're used, the history of the people who are communicating, all of those factor into uh, the meaning that, that one person extracts from, from a spoken message that another has, has uh, offered in a given situation. Another is the idea that the signals of language um, do not convey the information content of the language. Um, what is really being measured is the potential of the signals. Now this is a rather subtle point, but I can illustrate it for you in, in, a, in a number of ways. Um, what effects might those signals, those words produce in a given situation? What I'm really suggesting is the following. By analogy, labor is not seen. What we see is the results of labor. labor uh, language is not seen. What we see is the results of language. We experience the results of it. So a labor force has the potential, it, what it represents is the potential to produce goods. And a signal in the same way possess, possesses the potential to create communication, to communicate ideas from one person to another. So it isn't simply a matter of lining up the words like a train and then pulling out the meaning uh, because order among other things, there are many things other than the words themselves that, that alter the, the, the meaning that we actually receive in a given situation. Uh, in communicating, if you think about it a minute, we can break some of the rules some of the time and not hurt our ability to communicate with one another. One need not always speak the truth, for example. You know, for your children, uh, when, you're, when you're married with kids, you don't necessarily tell them, yeah, your Christmas gifts are wrapped, they're on the upper back closet of, of dad's closet, upper back shelf of dad's closet. I mean, you just, you talk around that. You don't speak truth in that situation. And yet, if they ask you point blank, have you gotten my Christmas gifts yet? You're not gonna tell them where they are. You might even fudge a little about whether you actually have them, knowing that they probably know that, uh, of course, they've got them and so forth. But they are interested in that. One doesn't always have to speak with common sense. 
let's just fly to the moon, one lover might say to another. That's not a literal translation of let's flap our arms to get outside and then flap to the moon, but in fact take a, a psychological trip to the moon. Let's, let's take the journey. One can even communicate with a message that is ultimately devoid of meaning. There's a classic example of that in the writing of Lewis Carroll, who really had his finger on language and what it can be used for. I'm quoting here directly, "'Twas Brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe." It's all pronounceable. It's all in, in uh, spelling and, and the words are, are nonsense, but, but uh, communication can occur in that situation. We have to add meaning to the words if we want to use that same sentence structure, but in fact communication has occurred in that situation. It goes on, it continues to exist. Um, to destroy communication, you really have to destroy all of the rules by which units hang together because there, there's something beyond just the mere assembly of words that still involves communication. Had I simply stated the same thing over and over again, um, rules are, are, well that was the point I was essentially making, is the rules are loosely crucial, but you can violate any one rule in communication and still communicate. So it isn't the rules themselves that convey the, the meaning. Um, and another is that novelty is crucial in communication, if you think about it. Had I simply stated the same thing over and over again, it's very unlikely that you would have sat here for an hour and, and ten minutes listening to me simply say the same thing over and over again. And therein lies the important cue as to what really encourages and maintains our communicating with one another, and that is the issue of novelty. How often it has been received previously, any given message, um, relative to all other possibilities, is one of the things that determines the worth of somebody, uh, somebody talking. Um, a president oftentimes will simply come in with a new agenda and, and what he's done essentially is, is to create a new kind of enrichment to, to what it means to be American. Uh, and he's, he's or she is espousing a, a particular approach in that situation. But it's the novelty that is being suggested by that wave of the hand at, at the uh, inauguration platform uh, that really gets the country Racked, uh, pulled together um, toward a given situation. We have some problems in, in describing what we mean by, um, by communications. Um, first is the impossibility of defining your vocabulary or my vocabulary, anyone's particular vocabulary. There's a whole range of gestures and signs and words that each of us use um, that's really impossible to specify definitively. Um, What's the impact of this on communication? Well, that's a little hard to specify precisely. What implies agreement uh, regarding a particular word's meaning? And as another example, since the camera is on me, if you and I are in the middle of an argument uh, and you have convinced me, I'm not going to, I may not simply say to you, you're right, I agree, uh, okay. What I may do is, is, you know, something like that. In that case, in one case, I'm telling somebody slow down or stop. Uh, but in, in the case of where you're arguing something that I've come to agree with, that kind of a gesture, you can't really say that, well, that means you agree. It may mean stop, it may mean hold off, it may mean stay back. There are a lot of different things that that simple gesture communicates. And, and that's one of the reasons we have difficulty really precisely defining what we mean by a particular word. Because the context is important, the other things going along with it can also be important. Um, because of differences in speaking. Um, we have differences in dialect, uh, differences in intonation, emphasis, loudness, all of those. All of those factors really make it difficult to define, to standardize, and to specify what utterances must be emitted in given situations in order to convey particular meaning. It's potential that's really being conveyed in a given message situation, in a communication situation. Thirdly, it's unlikely um, uh, I'm sorry, it's likely, I should say, that there's a blurring or an imprecision between the internal or subjective experience of the speaker or the writer relative to the, the ultimate external or objective words that he or she selects in which, with which to communicate. That's a fancy way of saying, essentially, that when you're writing or talking to somebody, if you're trying to define a term, what you essentially have to do is keep adding adjectives. I say to you, it's a rose, using an earlier example. It doesn't really capture the idea, well, maybe it's a deep red rose, or it's a luscious colored rose, or it's a rose with particularly unusual rich aroma. What I'm doing there is adding adjectives, and that's one of the beauties of language. You can take any given noun and add to it enough, well, from your perspective, enough, 
enough adjectives to enrich the meaning that is conveyed simply by the single noun that you're using in a, in a given situation. Um, this in turn leads to uh, another element of, of communication, and that has to do with the linkages that we establish between um, various kinds of people. A language grows from innumerable different, innumerable different communications within a given group. Um, but the nature of those communications may vary tremendously. You know, as you think about the functioning of, of the Department of Psychology and all the memos that go back and forth between faculty, between faculty and students, graduate students, and, and so forth. In the conversation, in a conversation, anytime you have a conversation, there's always a two-way link you as the receiver, me as the utterer, or me as the receiver, and you as the speaker. It really doesn't matter. There's a measure of symmetry anytime you, you are involved in a, a conversation, and the messages are essentially passing back and forth to add nuance, to modify the nature of the relationship. But it's a continuous uh, stimulus-response cyclical interaction is what's involved in that, in that case. Uh, remarks call up other remarks. I may make you think of something which leads you to think of something else. To, uh, the behavior of two individuals in a conversation becomes essentially concerted. It's, it's coordinated. It's cooperative. It's directed towards some implicit goal that both of them share in one way or another. And the other example I would point out is that, that there are also one-way communications. Um, we're involved in one. You can't argue with me. I'm simply laying out my views of what's involved in psychology. But there are other situations where if you come visit the office, say, I didn't quite understand. We can talk about it. Okay? TV, newspaper. All of those are examples of one-way communication. We'll pick it up next time on that theme.